Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, thanks everyone for coming to another one of the uh, One Pass thematic series on uh, stationary water waves. Um, today we have uh, Miles Wiegler from the University of Bath, and as you can see, he'll be talking about um, solitary waves and fronts. Uh, so with that, uh, Miles. Great. So. Uh... So thanks, Walter, I think, for, for the invitation. And of course, to uh, Ian, Benoit, and Javier, and Fabio for organizing this very nice uh, series. I've really been enjoying the talk so far. Um, it's 8 PM for me right now. So I haven't been able to make all of the talks uh, live. But uh, at least with the recordings, that's been sort of a good second best option. Yeah. And so I was asked to talk about, to sort of give an overview of solitary waves and fronts. And obviously, it's going to be a biased uh, overview. I think maybe it's fair to say there's going to be biased in favor of irrotational solitary waves. But anyway, let's get started. So I think we've seen now in this series the a similar uh, set of slides to the one I'm about to uh, show, setting up all of the equations. But it's good to do it each time, if only to fix notation. So here's the physical setup. We've got this water region shown in blue, lying below an air region shown just in white, and sitting above this flat impermeable bed. And so the interface, this free surface between the water and the air layer is one of the unknowns in the problem. And our model of the air is sort of gonna be very crude for most of this talk. It's just gonna be that it's a region of constant pressure. So let's set up just the coordinates. X is horizontal, Y is vertical. The bed at the bottom is going to be y equals minus d. So d is some sort of reference depth that we have in mind. And then the surface for the time dependent problem is some graph, let's say y is a function eta of x and t. And then we've got velocity components for this velocity field that's pushing all of these fluid particles around. Let's say little u for the horizontal velocity, little v for the vertical velocity. So inside the fluid, we've got the incompressible Euler equation. So these are the two momentum equations for horizontal and vertical momentum. Uh, this little p is the pressure, and then g is, the gra is gravity, which is sort of the restoring force in this problem. We've got two kinematic boundary conditions, so-called because they're only concerned the particle motion and not uh, forces. So these conditions say that if you start a little fluid particle off on the surface or on the bed, then even though the surface is moving all around, the fluid particle stays on the surface. It can move al along it, but it can't sort of leave it and go into the air region or into the bulk of the fluid. And then finally, we've got this so-called dynamic boundary condition, which is about the balance of forces, which says that this pressure, this pressure here that appears in the Euler equations, is a constant along the surface. Um, mathematically, we can normalize this constant to be zero. But of course, that's not the physical pressure that you'll see. But as far as this talk is concerned, this constant might as well be zero. And this comes from the fact that our model for the air is somehow a very crude one, uh, especially when compared to this relatively detailed model for the water. All right. But because this is a series on steady traveling waves, um, we're going to boost to a moving frame, say moving to the right with some constant speed c, and assume that all the time dependence now drops out of the problem. So instead of a depending on x and t, it only depends on x. And then for sort of traditional reasons, we're not going to complete this Galilean transformation by redefining the horizontal velocity u. And so inst instead, we're going to always write u minus c for this new velocity in the moving frame. All right. And now that we've got this steady problem in the moving frame, this is as good as a time as any to introduce the stream function. So since this velocity field is incompressible, if we sort of rotate it 90 degrees, we get something that's curl free. And since it's curl free, it has a potential. And so if you sort of unravel all of that, you see that there's a function psi whose gradient is given here in components. So one of the many nice things about the stream function psi is that if you start, if is that fluid particles, their trajectories are confined to level curves of psi. So if I start, so say these green curves here are the level curves of the stream function. If I start a little fluid particle out somewhere on one of these green curves, then in this moving frame, uh, the particle is going to stay along this green curve for all time. All right. Another nice thing about the stream function is that it lets us just reduce the number of unknowns in this problem. So right now we've got eta, we've got u, we've got v, and we've got p. So we have four functions to keep track of, but we can knock that down to two by replacing everything but eta with the stream function. So let's look at the boundary conditions first. So I said that particles were trapped along streamlines, so it's no surprise that the surface and the bed are now going to become streamlines. Um, let's say we normalize this constant at the uh, surface to be zero. It's not so important, but it may come up once or twice later in the talk. 
And I'm not even going to sort of give a notation for what this constant on the bed is, but it's some constant. Um, the condition that the pressure was constant become, looks a little bit more complicated now because we're using uh, Bernoulli's law in effect to sort of rewrite the pressure in terms of the stream function this way. So we've got this first term, which is a velocity squared with a half in front of it, so some sort of kinetic energy term. And then we have another term here that's actually a gravitational potential energy, so g times eta, which is just y. And this is some other constant. All right. And then finally, I've got this equation in the interior. And here, I've sort of snuck in an additional uh, very big assumption. So here, I'm assuming, as I will for the rest of the talk, that the curl of the velocity field, uh, the vorticity omega, vanishes identically. And so I didn't have to do this. I could have made a more general assumption and gotten a more general uh, sort of elliptic problem here, maybe a semi-linear elliptic problem, uh, most likely. But I'm not going to do that because I really want to focus on um, sort of solitary front type issues sort of to the exclusion of everything else. So I'm going to take the simplest irrotational case uh, for the rest of the talk. All right. So what is a solitary wave? I think there's a little bit of controversy over what the exact definition is, but here's the definition that I'm going to use. And I think it's the most sort of mathematically reasonable one to me. So in uh, John Holland's talk a few weeks ago, he had this really nice quote, which I meant to write down, but my vague memory of the quote was something like, uh, the solutions to these fluid mechanic problems that we can uh, write down explicitly are all so boring to be almost useless. Um, so here's one such solution. So imagine that the surface is completely flat and there's no motion at all. All the fluid particles are just staying put. All the velocity field is zero. Easy to check that this is a solution to the time dependent problem. And in our moving frame, instead of looking like it's still, all of the water is going to be rushing to the left now with some constant speed c. So it's easy to check that this is an explicit solution. And a solitary wave, when I say solitary wave in this talk, what I mean is some solution to the equations on the previous slide that converges to this explicit solution at infinity. So as x goes to plus infinity and as x goes to minus infinity. So somehow we're looking at a localized, if not necessarily small, perturbation of this exact solution, but that's it. There are no other assumptions when I say solitary wave. There's nothing about integrability. There's nothing about positivity or symmetry or anything like that. It's just, just a localized solution as opposed to a periodic wave where you have periodic dependence in X. Okay. So what about fronts? So a front um, is the same sort of idea, except for now the limits as you go to plus infinity and minus infinity are different. So when I say front or bore, I'm, I explicitly mean that these limits can't be the same because then it would be a solitary wave. So forgetting about, just, let's just think in the moving frame now. So if you're in the moving frame, sort of at one infinity, you see some uniform flow. And at the other infinity, you see some other uniform flow. And there's no chance for these flow rates to be the same because somehow the mass in here has to be the mass out here. So the areas of these two little rectangles have to agree. Now, this whole little picture I've drawn is a little disingenuous because as we will see later, in this sort of simplest case, there are no fronts only solitary waves. But you can indeed get fronts if you make your problem a little bit more complicated. For instance, if instead of one layer of fluid with one constant density, you consider two superposed layers with a rigid lid. This is perhaps the simplest situation in which you can get fronts, but there's many others. So we'll say a bit more about that later. All right, so how might we run into solitary waves and fronts if we weren't already um, smitten by them? So say we were really interested in periodic waves, as many people really are, um, and we wanted a really complete theory of periodic waves that allowed the period to become really large, then you might find things like this going on. So the period is quite large, and more than just the period being large, these troughs here are really, really flat. You know, forget about the crests, but the troughs are really, really long and flat. So you imagine that some, in some sort of you know, singular scaling limit, some sort of singular sort of regime where this wavelength goes to infinity, if you cut out a little period window, that this basically looks like a solitary wave. And there's lots of different sort of interesting questions you could ask about sort of to what extent, you know, exactly how this works, but sort of heuristically, that's a thing that could happen. Um, but now let's play the same trick. So you can keep playing this trick, this is the, which is the best thing about it. Suppose now that we have a special type of solitary wave, where in addition to sort of having this flat kind of trough at infinity, the crest is also really flat. So you get something that kind of looks like a tabletop or something like that. So if this tabletop is getting broader and broader, and this actually does happen in two layer systems, if this tabletop is getting broader and broader, 
then you sort of draw another dotted line down the middle and just look at half of this solitary wave and expect that this is more or less a front because things are pretty flat here. So the flow is pretty uniform already at this end and it's definitely uniform at this end. And so this sort of is somehow approximating a front or vice versa. And you can play this game. You can keep on playing this game. There's, there's no limit to how often you can play this game. So you could take a front now. And so it's got a nice flat limit at minus infinity and another flat limit at plus infinity. But suppose that it's developing some sort of shelf for finite values of x at some other depth. And this shelf is itself is also getting broader and broader and broader. Well, then you might take this sort of very degenerate looking front thing, cut it down the middle, and get two different fronts. So um, this point of view will be important later, but I just wanted to throw it out here uh, to start. OK. So now let's talk about parameters. So there were a lot of constants a few slides ago, and I didn't really want to write them down because I didn't really actually need notation for them. So if you have a solitary wave, then because you can sort of take the limits as things go to infinity, it's easy to check that there are actually only three dimensional parameters that appear in the problem. Very much unlike the periodic problem where you have additional parameters that are, are a bit more mysterious, honestly. So what are these parameters? You've got the depth, the asymptotic depth at infinity. You've got the gravitational, constant gravitational acceleration, and you have the speed of the wave as defined in the special reference frame where the fluid is at rest at infinity. And then we can non-dimensionalize too. I'm not going to non-dimensionalize, but imagine we wanted to non-dimensionalize. We've got a free length scale and a free velocity scale. And so we should really only have one dimensionless parameter left. And so when you do this, the dimensionless parameter that pops out is this dimensionless wave speed called the Froude number. So you take the real wave speed and you divide by this sort of critical wave speed square root of GD. And so it turns out that uh, many, many things are different depending on whether this Froude number is above, below, or equal to the critical value one. So this is called supercritical, critical, and subcritical. You can find this terminology in any, flu any good fluid mechanics textbooks. You know, Kundu and Cohen has a whole little section about this. It's everywhere. Um, and because it's the only parameter in the problem, um, and, and because this, this value is critical in so many ways, you can sort of pick your favorite way to understand what this means, uh, why this value is special. But I'm going to pick a very specific one, which is kind of adapted to the solitaire, which is somehow useful later on in the talk. So remember, the solitary wave is a perturbation of this explicit solution, where this stream function being this linear function of y is you take a derivative with respect to y to get this uniform horizontal flow. And then eta being 0 just means that the surface is flat. So this solution uh, exists for different fruit numbers. And when you linearize around it, the sort of type of problem that you get depends exactly on this fruit number, critical fruit number threshold. So let's see a little bit of that. So remember, here's, so here again is this explicit solution. Psi is minus Cy and eta equals 0. And we're not going to tell you how you linearize around it. But say you, you linearize the way you would, um, the way you know, like an, an engineer would, or the way that Stoker does in his book, just sort of a real formal linearization. Uh, this is the problem that you get. I mean, the, the reason that I have to sort of emphasize that it's formal is because the free surface, of course, is moving around. And so linearizing requires sort of a little bit of care. But anyway, you can do it formally. And this is what you get. So the this sort of Dirichlet condition on the flat bottom that's not moving around sort of stays and becomes homogeneous, fine. Um, this condition that your harmonic in the interior becomes fine. And then the boundary that used to be uh, not flat is now completely flat because we're linearizing around something that's flat. In general, if we linearize around some any shape, then the sort of that domain shape is fixed in this formal argument. You're always sort of uh, doing a problem in the reference domain of the solution you linearize around. So let's look at this condition up here. So the boundary condition used to be that the stream function was some constant value 0. But now, because I have to lit, but because this boundary condition is on a boundary which is itself moving, you somehow get this other term, essentially from the chain rule. And so this is the new kinematic boundary condition over here. And this is the dynamic boundary condition, which actually doesn't sort of involve these chain rule terms because they all drop out um, for such a simple solution. Anyway, let's look at this problem that we've got. So it's constant coefficient. It's translation invariant. Um, it's the nicest sort of linear problem you could ask for. And so we can solve it explicitly just by separating variables. So say we're looking for bounded periodic solutions. That's the usual thing that you do when you're separating variables. So we'll say that this linearized eta variable is some complex exponential with some real wave number k. So you take that, you plug it into, say, the two kinematic boundary conditions and this uh, condition in the bulk, and you get this explicit formula for the stream function. And then you take this and you plug it in to the remaining boundary condition and you discover a relationship, a dispersion relation, really, 
between the parameters in the problem. So this gives you the wave speed C um, for this linearized problem as a function of the gravitational acceleration, the asymptotic depth, and this wave number parameter k. And I just want to mention in this little box in passing that uh, this formal linearized calculation is also useful if you want to think about sort of the asymptotic uh, behavior, sort of asymptotic expansions as x goes to plus infinity of a solitary wave. Because if you plug in purely imaginary k, it's telling you about exponentially decaying solutions. And again, it's completely explicit. This tanch basically becomes a tan. All right. So let's draw a picture of this dispersion relation and see how it relates to this subcritical supercritical distinction. So on the horizontal axis, we've got the wave number k. On the vertical axis, we've got the wave speed c. And here's this critical wave speed square root gd. So above this dashed green line, everything's supercritical. Below this dashed green line, everything's subcritical. And now I want to draw in this dispersion relation that we calculated on the last slide. So here it is. So as the wave number k gets smaller, so the waves are getting longer, the wave speed is also increasing, and it tops out at this critical wave speed GD. So one way to think of this critical wave speed is that this is somehow the maximum speed of an infinitesimal periodic wave, or the speed of an infinitesimal periodic wave that's really long, has a really long wavelength. Okay. And so, you know, of course, when I'm saying all this, what I, just to sort of make the connection with the previous slide uh, maybe a bit more clear, if I pick some point on this curve, then the calculation from the last slide sort of tells me that I expect to find periodic solutions with approximately this wave number traveling at approximately this speed on just sort of a purely formal level. And we heard a little bit in John Tolan's talk about how this can be made rigorous and how sort of now, nowadays, if someone gives you a good formulation of the problem, this is some, somehow almost an exercise in local bifurcation theory. But of course, when Nekrasov and Levi Civita were proving this back in the 20s, it was anything but. So there's this whole, um, I mean, we have these little curves of small periodic waves filling out, say, this purple region here in this KC space. And of course, there's a further story about large amplitude periodic waves, but let's not go there because we're mostly interested in solitary waves. Okay, so that's a beautiful story. Um, Airy would be proud. Um, but what does this tell us about solitary waves? So somehow a solitary wave should have wave number zero if it has any wave number at all. So somehow maybe we're looking at this red point in this dispersion diagram. So somehow, if the linear theory is right, then a wave with infinite wavelength, whatever that is, should travel at exactly this critical speed. Already things seem a little bit fishy. But if you actually try to turn the crank, sort of everything falls apart completely here. So this formal linear analysis uh, does not pr does not, doesn't say anything about solitary waves. It certainly doesn't give you any reason to expect that solitary waves exist. And so when Russell in the 1840s is writing all of these reports about how he sees these solitary waves, what is this, this you know, great wave? I mean, he has all of this wonderful flowery language about how wonderful these waves are. Um, Airy and company are completely unimpressed because, and essentially say, uh, the only waves that exist are the waves that are on this dispersion diagram. And this dispersion diagram doesn't have solitary waves. Maybe you're just looking at a wave with really small k. That's sort of what they say to Russell. From a pure math point of view, say we want to use local bifurcation theory, what goes wrong is that when we linearize the problem at this critical wave speed, the operators that we get are just hopelessly non fredholm I think the range isn't closed, if I remember correctly. And so there's just no way to use local bifurcation theory to construct them. So what do we have to do instead? Well, we essentially, we, this theory can't see solitary waves because solitary waves are nonlinear, and this is a linear theory. So if we want to see solitary waves, we need at least a weakly nonlinear theory. And that's exactly what Boussinesque does in 1877 and Cordovegan de Vries pick up in 1895 um, and many, many authors, uh, maybe even some before. But basically the idea is that instead of sort of a regular expansion where sort of eta is some series in epsilon and where each term in the series depends on x, you have to insert essentially a square root epsilon and rescale your horizontal variable x. So somehow you need a long wave model if you want to see these. And you do a similar expansion in psi. And so here I've chosen the small, you, can, you, you know, you have your choice about what the small parameter is, but here I've chosen the small parameter to be somehow a measure of how supercritical you are. So it's, so you're just a little bit, so the fruit number is just a little bit bigger than one in a way that's measured by epsilon. So now you take this formal expansion, it's trickier to work with, um, but eventually sort of as a solvability condition for something at the level two or something like that, you eventually find this clean ODE for 801 which after you rescale appropriately is exactly the steady version of KDV um, as you know and love it. Uh, 
And the nice thing about this ODE is that it has this explicit Setch squared soliton solution, which decays exponentially um, in both directions. And so sort of undoing the scaling, um, what this type of formal analysis predicts is that solitary waves do indeed exist. They have an amplitude of order epsilon and somehow a length scale of order one over square root epsilon. Okay, so this is the sort of formal theory of why solitary waves exist, but how can we make this rigorous? It's much harder than doing local bifurcation theory somehow. Um, it goes back to Lerventiev in 1943. That's the version that's in Russian. I think the version in the English translation actually comes out in 54, if I remember correctly. So the same year as Friedrichs and Hires. But anyway, the way that Lerventiev gets at these waves is roughly speaking, he takes long wavelength limits of periodic waves, but these can't be somehow periodic waves that he only knows linear information about. He somehow needs weakly nonlinear, he somehow needs something like those expansions from the previous slide, but for periodic waves. And he's somehow able to make this all work. Um, Friedrichs and Hires, a little bit over 10 years later, have a much more direct argument that doesn't involve this uh, period going to infinity business. And it's essentially an implicit function theorem argument. But it's not an a sort of a naive explicit implicit function theorem argument that where they just sort of look at the equation, pick some spaces, and then just apply the implicit function theorem, because then they'd run into this non-Fredholm pro problem. So before they apply the implicit function theorem, they have to rescale with the square root epsilon. They have to work in exponent. It's crucial that they work in exponentially weighted spaces. And they also need to sort of know sort of by hand that the KDV soliton is what to expect to leading order. So if you combine all of those things, then you can indeed do a fixed point argument. And if you want a modern treatment of this sort of argument, I highly recommend the appendix to this Pego Soon paper about the linear stability of solitary waves, where they give a very quick version of this construction in sort of more modern language than Friedrichs and Hires are using in 1954. Okay, uh, speaking of things that are a bit more modern, um, in 1977, Beale goes back and gives an alternate proof using Nash-Moser implicit function theorem. So there are some things to like about this paper, but I think a sort of a uncharitable thing to say about this paper is that somehow he's using Nash-Moser Nash Moser in a situation where you don't have to. So that's one thing to keep in mind, right? So Friedrich and Hires can do this with just the regular implicit function theorem. Um, Beale uses Nash Moser, so a much heavier technology, but somehow this makes some other parts of the problem easier, maybe. I mean, it depends on how much you like Nash Moser, I think, how much you like this paper. Anyway, what I want to focus a bit more on is this totally different approach uh, that Milka takes in 1988. So he takes a a dynamical systems uh, approach to this, thinking of this horizontal variable x as kind of playing the role of time, and then looking for, which is sort of, so that's spatial dynamics, x is playing the role of time, and now he looks for a center manifold in this very sort of bizarre uh, evolution equation in x that he's written down. Um, <clears throat> and so if Pego and Soon give what I think is the simplest proof of this, I think that this maybe not Milka's 80, 1988 paper, where he sort of is developing a general theory and then doing this as sort of a showcase for the theory. Um, but this general center manifold technique, I think is extremely powerful and more or less gives you the strongest local existence results. So I mean, what's stronger than just having local existence? Well, I mean, one thing that's a little bit stronger is that this crucial square root epsilon scaling, all of these other arguments sort of have it baked in at the very beginning. You need to start with this, knowing that the scaling is what you want, and then eventually you can make the argument work. The center manifold technique is totally different. You can, all of the hard parts of the argument, somehow all of the heavy machinery happens without rescaling. And then you rescale at the very, very end, which I think is a very attractive feature. The other thing is that it doesn't involve fancy weighted spaces. So the sort of uniqueness type statements that you get are in regular unweighted spaces without any scaling, which we'll actually need later on. And then finally, uh, the sort of description that you get is really uh, clarifying uh, conceptually, I think, and lets you analyze, sort of lets you quickly guess how to prove various uh, qualitative properties of the solution. So I'm gonna just give one quick slide on this spatial dynamics technique, which doesn't really do it justice, but hopefully gives uh, a vague idea. So the thing I wanna focus on is just this top part here. So, because this claim is somehow so strong that it's a little bit uh, hard to understand, actually, the first few times you see it. So, suppose we're looking at solutions where this small parameter epsilon is really small, and where the wave is small. That's the only assumption. Small in some function space, very reasonable smallness assumption, nothing hidden there. Then, for instance, the free surface eta, which is a function of x, exactly solves some ODE. 
So we started out with a PDE, an elliptic, essentially an elliptic PDE in some sort of infinite cylinder after we do some flattening transformation. And what the center manifold business is telling us is that actually for small solutions in this parameter regime, this PDE is somehow equivalent to an ODE, which is hugely useful. Um, of course, it would be especially useful if they just gave us a formula for this ODE, but they don't. So it's an ODE whose right-hand side is unknown. We don't have an explicit formula for it, but we can tailor expand it to any order. So somehow we have an exact solution to an ODE that we know sort of approximately. Um, and this is just hugely, I mean, this sort of took me a while to sort of fully appreciate, but this is hugely useful. For instance, say we just want to prove the existence of solitary waves. So you do some expansion and use some rescaling with this ODE after Taylor expanding it appropriately. And then you find somehow to leading order, you just get the KDV phase portrait. So here's a phase portrait of an ODE like this uh, with eta on the horizontal axis and eta prime on the vertical axis. We're interested in solutions that, you know, this little loop here is a periodic solution, but this uh, sort of fishy loop is a homoclinic solution, homoclinic to the origin. And so this represents a solitary wave. So because in forward and backward time and time is X, uh, both eta and eta prime are vanishing. So if you want to prove that the that uh, solitary waves exist in the spatial dynamics framework, then what you essentially need to show is that when you add in the sort of extra terms in F that you've been neglecting at this point in your argument, then this qualitative phase portrait sort of stays the same. And this ends up being something about the transverse intersection about this red curve and the eta axis. It's, it's actually a pretty easy argument once, once you've used this heavy machinery to reduce it to a question about ODEs. Um, so here's another thing that I won't really quite be able to do justice to, but um, if maybe let me just say sort of as an advertisement for uh, this paper with Ming Chen and Sam Walsh, that if you're interested in this sort of result and you're not already an expert in the spatial dynamics, dynamics business, then have a look at this preprint because we provide what I think can be safely said is a slightly more user-friendly uh, version for a specialized class of problems, which includes most water wave things you might want to do. And we're inspired uh, by this nice paper by Fay and Scheel. Um, yeah, yeah, so anyway, that's a very, very brief um, introduction to spatial dynamics. Um, now I want to switch gears and talk about the qualitative properties of solitary waves. So we've constructed at least some solitary waves. And I want to ask a slightly different question, which is, say you hand me a solitary, an arbitrary solitary wave, or a solitary wave with just some abstract, just some property, but no sort of smallness assumption and no sort of construction of how you got it. Uh, and the game is, what can I tell you back about the solitary wave that's true? So what might I want to tell you is true? So I might want to tell you that the wave is supercritical, since this has a lot of sort of uh, spectral implications. It sort of means that it's a sort of a Fred Holmness assumption. It means lots of very nice things. I might also want to tell you that eta is positive, um, so that the wave deflects upwards, like this picture that I'm drawing here. And then finally, I might want to tell you that the wave is symmetric. So after translation, eta is even, for instance, and that it's strictly decreasing on either side of a central crest. So, you know, for periodic water waves, um, you have these sort of secondary bifurcations where the number of crests and troughs change and things like that. Um, does that happen for solitary waves or do they all have a single crest? Um, the solutions that we get from KDV, uh, even when you make it rigorous, all have all of these properties. This is not so hard to check. And so the question is, suppose someone hands me a wave that's not small amplitude, and we'll see later that not all solitary waves have small amplitude. Uh, what can we say about these uh, important, but also kind of basic properties? So thing one, if you hand me a wave with a supercritical wave speed, then it's automatically a wave of elevation. And this is a nice, this is a really cute maximum principle argument, which at least goes back to this paper of Craig and Sternberg in 88, but is probably somehow implicit in something earlier than then. Um, the nicest presentation is probably in this later paper, single author paper by Craig in 02 about sort of the non-existence of solitary water waves of various kinds. So let's prove the contrapositive, I guess. If you're not a wave of elevation, then you're not supercritical. So if you're not a wave of elevation, then that means that eta somehow dips below this dashed line that's giving you the asymptotic height. Or it has some minimum that exactly sits on this dashed line, but that's a harder picture to draw, so let me not draw that picture. So the proof is a simple comparison argument. I have this solution, which I know, but I really don't know much about it except for what it does at infinity and what it does at this point. And I compare it to a completely explicit solution. So I pick another one of these you know, sort of boring solutions with a flat surface and uniform flow. And I pick the depth very carefully 
so that it just touches this minimum point. Um, so that determines that part of my flow, but I also get this free parameter of what the speed of this flow is. And I'm going to pick it so that these two solutions are compatible in the sense that they have the same mass flux. So the sort of the flux, uh, the sort of amount of water coming in here is the same as the amount of water coming out there. And then it's a sort of a nice little exercise in the maximum principle at this point to justify why if you take the difference between these two stream functions, thought of as a function in this red strip, then it achieves a maximum or a minimum, one or the other at this purple point, and then, when, and then you apply hop there and you plug into the boundary conditions and lo and behold, you immediately discover that the fruit number has to be strictly, strictly less than one. Okay, so that's basically a complete proof that all supercritical waves with fruit number greater than one are waves of elevation in that this, the minimum value of eta is actually equal to zero and it's attained only at infinity. All right. There's actually, uh, the reverse implication is also true with a totally different proof. So instead of a maximum principle argument, this is an integral identity argument. So all the way back in, I think maybe one of the first reports or two that Russell gives on solitary waves. Um, I mean, he doesn't use exactly this notation, but in his notation, he writes down sort of an empirical formula for their speed as it relates to their amplitude, sort of the maximum of eta is some sort of amplitude parameter and the depth of the stream. And so this is the one that he writes down. And it turns out that this is asymptotically correct for these solutions that we rigorously can construct using KDB. But more than 100 years later, Starr, in this really nice paper in the Journal of Marine Research, where he proves a whole host, sort of almost a complete catalog. I don't, it's not maybe not quite a complete catalog, but he, uses, he proves a huge number of integral identities for periodic and solitary water waves. One of the identities he proves in this paper looks like this. So it looks like Russell's sort of uh, asymptotic empirical formula and that it's got an F squared on the left hand side and a one plus on the right hand side. But instead of this dimensionless amplitude, it has this sort of integral dimensionless amplitude where we compare the integral of eta squared, which if you think about it is some sort of excess uh, potential energy in the wave up to you know factors of G. And this denominator here is the integral of eta, which is somehow the excess mass that this wave is carrying. And miraculously, this is just an exact formula that's true all the time. And of course, Starr's proof in 1947 is formal um, in that he doesn't explicitly, in that he doesn't really worry about the convergence of these integrals. But uh, Amy and Toland in 81 uh, worry quite a bit about the convergence of these integrals and are able to show that this is actually not an issue. And then McLeod gives a much slicker, shorter proof um, that you don't have to worry about this. Essentially, what McLeod does is he shows that if you treat the boundary terms when you integrate by parts carefully, um, then you can show that these integrals converge and that this identity holds somehow all in one go. All right. So anyway, what does this have to do with being supercritical? Well, if eta is, if you have a wave of elevation so that eta is greater than or equal to zero, and of course not identically zero, then when you plug it into this formula, this whole second term is positive. And so you just have one plus something positive, and so the fruit number is strictly greater than one. And remember, this, this, this estimate is sharp, actually, for small amplitude waves whose fruit number gets arbitrarily close to one as the amplitude goes to zero. Yeah, and so star's identity is used for a lot of uh, other things. So in particular, you can almost immediately get some, some nice upper bounds, which are certainly not sharp. Um, but anyway, enough about star's identity. Let's move on to symmetry and monotonicity. So suppose that you have symmetry and monotonicity, and we know now that these two things are equivalent, so you can actually just assume one of them. Then the claim, what's proved in this Craig and Sternberg paper in 88, is that necessarily you have symmetry and monotonicity about a central crest. And since this is supposed to be sort of an expository talk uh, with uh, graduate students in the audience, this means that I get to draw a little picture of the moving planes argument, which is what they use. So here's, here's my solution. Um, it turns out that if you refine their argument, you actually only need to k in one direction, but let's forget about that for now. So let's say this is my solution. I make a copy of my solution in red, and then I flip it around some axis like this. And so the first, and then what I'm doing is I'm sort of comparing this red solution to this blue solution, but only to the right of this dashed line, again, using the maximum principle. And the first thing that I want is for this red curve to always lie below the black curve. Somehow this is a thing that I need to get this argument started or that Craig and Sternberg need to get their argument started. And you can do this by actually proving exponential asymptotics for sort of, uh, sort of given uh, asymptotic expansion for what these solitary waves have to look like at infinity. Or actually, if you don't like that, uh, which sometimes I don't, um, then there are other ways to do this where you just do even more maximum principle arguments. But anyway, suppose that when we move this thing, red thing far enough to the left, then 
this whole part of the curve is cleanly under the black curve. Then the game is to start sliding it to the right until something breaks. So until we get up to a point like this, where the red and the black curve are somehow touching tangentially. And then you're in a situation where you can sort of bring the full power of the maximum principle and the Hopf lemma to bear, and eventually you're able to sort of get a contradiction unless these red and black curves completely uh, coincide. That's the sort of way that this works. And then when you get that they completely coincide, you conclude that actually the solution is both monotone and symmetric. Okay, so summing everything up that we have so far, all of these nice properties, well, we don't know, quite know that they're all true, but we know that these two properties about being supercritical and elevation are equivalent. And that in this case where both of these are true, we have monotonicity and symmetry. So the, the obvious question to ask is, um, are, is you know, are we always in this nice case where everything that we want is true or are there other waves uh, with subcritical fruit numbers? And so I wanna tell you a little bit about that story. So, the conjecture, for instance, in this Craig and Sternberg paper, is that there aren't, is that there are no solitary waves with speeds below this critical threshold. And the sort of hand wavy argument, the sort of physical argument that you see in lots of places roughly goes like this. So suppose you did have a subcritical solitary wave. So then it's somehow represented by this point down here in red. If you look across, there are periodic waves, small periodic waves traveling at the same speed. So what you should be able to do somehow is maybe superimpose those periodic waves on your solitary wave at infinity and still get a solution. And somehow if you, I mean, this is somehow the thinking. And so some sort of argument where you think about the amplitude of these ripples that you're adding and sort of how many parameters you have in the problem sort of leads you to the sort of very tenuous conclusion that if you had that subcritical solitary waves ought to be rare if they exist at all. Um, but yeah, but so this is a very sort of physical argument. And as far as I know, uh, it really doesn't suggest a proof technique. Um, it's just sort of an argument about generically what you expect to be happen to happen, but it doesn't suggest an explanation for why it absolutely does not happen. Um, and maybe I just want to spend a quick minute, maybe I'll go a little bit fast on this slide, um, to sort of say a little bit more about why this is a subtle question. So say we ask the same question, but now for KDV. So KDV, we had this face portrait that kind of looked like a fish before with the eta and the eta prime, where we had this homoclinic loop, which was in red to the origin. So that was with a supercritical fruit number greater than one. If you've got a subcritical fruit number, then that saddle at the origin becomes a center. And so now the face portrait looks something like this. It's, and sort of the, the origin is surrounded by these small periodic orbits. And there's just no room in phase space to have a homoclinic orbit. But this, but this fact is, it, this is somehow just an artifact about the fact that KDV is a second order ODE. As soon as you take an even slightly more complicated model where your phase space is a little bit bigger, this argument breaks down completely because you get a picture that looks more like this. So say you have a higher order model, then you still have what's now a sort of a center manifold of periodic orbits, but it's just two dimensional. You don't get more periodic orbits when you look at a more complicated model. And so all the other directions are stable and unstable directions. And so now when you're looking for a homoclinic loop, you're asking for these unstable and stable manifolds to meet up. And again, by dimension counting, this will be difficult. So it should only be possible if you somehow have a lot of parameters in your problem. And anyway, this, is, this whole issue is sometime, sometimes goes under the name embedded solitary waves. Um, I'm, I'm very much not an expert on this, but here are some references of uh, people talking about how this may or may not be possible. I mean, there, there are sort of difficult papers on this uh, that don't even quite resolve the question, even for sort of a two degree of freedom Hamiltonian systems. So this is, this is somehow a very subtle question, even for ODEs even though it's one that you can sometimes answer for ODs. But nevertheless, um, in some semi-recent work with Vladimir Kozlov and Yevgeny Lakarov, we've managed to finally uh, resolve this conjecture, which has been bugging me for, I mean, for as long as I've been thinking about this stuff, really. Um, I don't have time to get into the proof in detail, but the one ingredient which I want to highlight is this new fun function which we introduce, which we sort of alliteratively call the flow force flux function. Um, so what you do is you take, uh, in this irrotational case, when you have vorticity, which is what we're mostly interested in, uh, the formula, this whole story becomes much more subtle. But in this irrotational case, what you do is you take your two velocity components. So psi x is your vertical velocity, and then your horizontal velocity, but not in the moving frame, in the lab frame. You square them, you take their difference, and you take an integral dy. Now, why you would do this is not immediately clear and has something to do with the, it has something to do with momentum conservation, why you would do this. 
Um, but anyway, what you can check is that because of the way you've defined this, it's easy to see that this function vanishes at infinity. And since it's an integral from the bed, which is at y equals minus d, it vanishes at the bed. And because it's defined in terms of squares, of differences of squares, of derivatives of a harmonic function, and then an integral, it's not so hard to check that it's a harmonic function. Again, this is much more difficult uh, with vorticity. But the sort of truly magical thing is that you can explicitly calculate its values on the surface. So this is not at all obvious and has something to do with momentum conservation and some sort of very clever, I don't know how exactly Yevgeny uh, came up with this idea. But anyway, if you evaluate this function on the free surface, you get g eta squared, and that's non-negative. It's just barely non-negative, but it's non-negative. And somehow this function, which you both have an explicit formula for and this nice elliptic characterization of um, is super useful. And it leads to a relatively quick proof uh, resolving this conjecture. And uh, if you look at some of uh, Yevgeny's later papers, uh, he's using this flow force flux function to do lots of other exciting things that are sort of uh, much more subtle uh, with periodic waves too. So anyway, I, I, as far as I know, uh, this function for this sort of purpose hadn't been introduced. Um, and I think that there's really a lot of potential here. I think one final remark to make about it is that if you know the Babenko equation, then somehow in this irrotational case, this function is somehow solving a sub problem that appears in the Babenko equation. So in the Babenko equation, you see these Fourier multiplies hitting eta squared. They're essentially asking you to sort of apply Dirichlet Neumann, do it, apply a Dirichlet Neumann operator to g eta squared. And this little calculation is showing you that the solution to the sort of harmonic function that you get when you extend g eta squared is explicit. And that this is a really useful thing to have. Okay, anyway, enough about that. Let's have a brief digression or let's have a quick conclusion. So now, so now with this latest result, any solitary wave, no if, ands, or buts, has all of these nice properties. Because we've shown that it's automatically supercritical, and at that point, you can sort of stitch together all the results from the previous slides, and you get everything that you ever wanted uh, with no uh, assumptions. So I'm very happy about this. All right, so now for a digression. So we've been talking about solitary waves so far, but what about fronts? I promise you they don't exist, and here's why. It's, again, this is another uh, sort of very nice and uh, quick after the fact argument. So if you sort of go back to your fluid mechanics textbook and you start making little control volumes and looking at all of your conservation laws, if you suppose that you have a front like this with some depth D and C, little d and C uh, as X goes to minus infinity and some different depth, capital D and capital C as X goes to plus infinity, then these three quantities have to be the same. So the sort of mass flux has to be the same. Somehow some Bernoulli type thing has to be the same and some sort of momentum flux has to be the same. This is the same, this is the sort of momentum flux that's involved in the definition of the flow force flux function. And if you just do a bit of algebra, you can see that these sort of so-called conjugate flow equations have no non-trivial, have no solutions which are physically relevant at least. It's just a quick algebra calculation once you've written this down. Um, if someone, I mean, if someone wants to hear it, I, I have a story, a sort of, I can tell us maybe a slightly more satisfying story about why you could sort of, you know, sort of physically why these solutions ought not to have any uh, solutions. But anyway, this calculation is quick and easy. And also, if you want to know the page number in LAM where this is done, I can tell you. All right. So, um, oh, one more thing about this is that all of, of course, we do have fronts when, for instance, you have two layers and then these polynomial equations still exist, but they're much more complicated because we've got a bunch more parameters going on and then they do have solutions, sort of is the short answer. Okay, so digression over, let's talk about large amplitude waves now. So we've constructed small amplitude waves. We have a good theory about somehow an arbitrary wave if we know that given that it exists. Let's now start thinking about how we could construct a large amplitude wave. So the obvious tool to use here is the analytic global bifurcation theory originally due to Dancer in the 70s, but uh, sort of improved and much more uh, easy and sort of uh, presented in a much more digestible way by Buffoni and Toland in this nice 2003 book. So this theory has been extremely successful for periodic waves. So if we're doing periodic water waves and if we're doing solitary water waves, we somehow want to emulate the periodic arguments and sort of use the same theory. But we run into a host of problems. So the first thing, is that this global bifurcation theory requires the low requires you somehow to have used local bifurcation theory uh, to construct your small amplitude solutions. And I just got finished saying that we cannot do this. This is not an option for us. Another thing that it asks sort of in a related way is that all linearized operators everywhere have to be fed home with index zero. 
But we just pointed out that one of our linearized operators isn't even Fredholm. So this again seems very worrying. And then finally, and maybe most significantly, uh, you need bounded sets of solutions to be compact in whatever function space that you're working in. And here, you know, if you're doing a periodic problem, then you have the usual compact embeddings, you know, between Holder or Sobolev spaces, and these are super important. You know, if these and Shouter estimates somehow can start helping you prove something like this. But when our domain is unbounded, uh, this goes out the window, and you know, bad things can happen. We'll see some bad things on the next slide. So nevertheless, Amy and Tolan in 1981, in two papers in 1981, actually, give two different, uh, two slightly different uh, global bifurcation arguments for solitary waves. And so how do they do it? Well, they somehow sidestep all of these problems by considering a sort of approximate problem where you do have all these compactness properties and then taking some sort of limit, kind of like a long wavelength limit. So in the second paper, it's precisely a long wavelength limit for periodic waves. Um, this limit has to be taken in, in a slightly weak sense, but, but still they get sort of a global connected set of solutions. They're able to say everything that you want to say about the wave that you get somehow at the end of this continuum solution. It's, it's a pretty satisfying result um, in terms of its conclusions at the end of the day. But for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna present sort of a different approach, um, which of course I like better because it's the approach that I use. Um, but trying, I, I think it's not, totally unfair to say that it's, it's more direct, at least in the sense that it doesn't pass through approximate problems. Let me at least just say that. Okay, so to get some intuition about what's going on, let's think about an ODE. So suppose we have this second order Hamiltonian ODE, U double prime plus the derivative of some potential is zero. And I've snuck in some parameter lambda that this potential also depends on. So as I'm, as met, almost all of you, I'm sure, know this is a model for a ball rolling up along a landscape, um, which is just the graph of this potential function v. So let's just see some little cute animations of how this goes. So say I start my little ball here on this left-hand side of this valley. Then I draw a dashed line or, along here. And if I just hold my ball and just let it drop, then it will drop, and then it will roll down to the bottom, and then it will roll all the way up to the other side until it's reached the same height converted all of its potential energy into kinetic and then all that kinetic energy back into potential. And so in the phase portrait here in U, U prime, we've moved um, from this point on the U axis to this point on the U axis. And then of course, it stays there for, uh, for an instant and then turns around and does the exact same thing in reverse. And at the end, you've got this little periodic loop. So say we want a homoclinic solution like a solitary wave. Then we have to start our little ball at the top of this hill, say and sort of kick it just sort of an infinitesimal amount to the right. And then it's gonna again, fall down into the valley and back up like this, and then stay there and then go back. But somehow if we do this just right, then we'll spend somehow an infinite amount of time falling uh, off this hill and then another infinite amount of time uh, reaching up. So this whole thing happens in infinite time instead of a single period happening in finite time. Okay, so anyway, that's a little bit about Hamiltonian mechanics. Let's now think about sort of the global bifurcation implications of this picture. So when we're doing global bifurcation or global continuation, the question we're really asking is, as I vary this parameter lambda, what can go wrong with this picture? So if I somehow move this in most nice smooth ways, in many nice smooth ways, this homoclinic loop sort of is gonna stick around and just sort of deform smoothly and everything's good. But some dramatic things can happen. So for instance, what if suddenly the concavity of my hill switches sign right here? Then instead of being at a little local maximum, we're at a little local minimum. And so if I kick my ball, it just rolls back and forth and I just have these periodic orbits. And so just like with K subcritical KDV, um, there is no chance of having a homoclinic orbit anymore. So let's call that a spectral degeneracy. And I sort of want to emphasize that this is a calculation that you do at zero. So in some sense, this depends only on lambda. I don't need to know anything, any further details of my solution to think about this condition. The other thing that could go wrong is I could have another peak that sort of appears um, far away. So, so, you know, so the origin stays a nice local maximum, but we get another local maximum at exactly the same height. So as this, when this happens, then suddenly when I kick this yellow ball over, it's not gonna make it all the way to the right-hand side over here. It's gonna stop and sort of in infinite time, uh, it's gonna just stay here at the top of this hill. So instead of having a homoclinic orbit that returns to the origin, I'm gonna have a heteroclinic orbit that starts at this yellow point and ends up at this purple point. 
And of course, if I kick this purple ball, it will do a nice homoclinic orbit for me. And of course, there's another heteroclinic orbit going back the other way. So that's the full sort of phase portrait there. Okay, so the sort of general theory, let's call it, or general result that I want to present is somehow uh, related to all of these papers, uh, but really these last two papers uh, with Ming Chen and Sam Walsh is, is where you should look. Um, we prove the following, very roughly speaking. I think Sam will probably be angry, at, is probably secretly angry at me right now. Um, but so suppose that instead of a second order ODE, you give me a fully nonlinear elliptic problem in an infinite strip. So this looks, on the face of it, this, I mean, this is a much more complicated uh, thing to be given, right? So, so now x is our sort of time-like variable, thinking about our ODE, x is like x in the water wave problem. And then, you know, it's a cylinder, say, because we've done one of these coordinate tr flattening transformations that Susanna talked about. So if you sort of use a coordinate transformation on the water wave problem, you get something of roughly this form. So suppose that you have an elliptic problem like this, and that someone hands you a curve of small solutions, say one that they constructed using these center manifolds. And sort of very roughly speaking, suppose that these small solutions they hand you are all symmetric and monotone, which we know for the water wave application, and they have some good spectral properties. Basically somehow the analog of this V double prime at zero has the right sign. Then, I mean, I haven't told you what analytic bifurcation theory is, and I'm not going to because I'm sort of don't have time to, but it's a good thing that you want to work. And it still works, but you have to add two new possibilities. And the two new possibilities that you have to add, even for this complicated elliptic problem, are essentially the possibilities that we saw before for ODEs. So one thing that could happen is that somehow a, the linearized problem when you freeze coefficients at infinity could change character. So this is somehow the sort of local max becoming a local min. And the other thing that could happen is that you could have solutions which broaden and broaden and, it's, and sort of if you take a weak limit, a weak limit of translates, you eventually get a front. And so somehow these are the only additional things that can go wrong when you're dealing with solitary waves, say, as opposed to periodic waves. So let's real quick, um, as I'm sort of running out the clock, let's see how these additional possibilities can be dealt with for the problem that we have in mind, which is these solitary water waves. So what is the spectral degeneracy? Well, sort of, Perhaps unsurprisingly, this, spec, you know, this good spectral property I keep on talking about is just supercriticality, nothing more, right? So supercriticality, one way of thinking about it is that your linearized problem when you freeze coefficients at infinity sort of is good, is invertible somehow. So the spectral degeneracy alternative that we have to worry about is that we have a family of supercritical waves with fruit numbers greater than one where the fruit number is approaching one, this critical value. And of course, we know about one such family. It's the family that we got from KDV. But the question is somehow, when we're doing this global continuation argument, are there any other families that do this? And there aren't. And the reason that there aren't is because we have these very strong results saying that waves have to be supercritical. Somehow, this is not surprisingly an important thing, right? So such, such a sequence might converge, you might guess, to a critical wave with fruit number equal one. But those don't exist. So we can rule that possibility out. And then the other thing that you somehow need is a very strong uniqueness statement. And the center manifold sort of theory gives us that. So very roughly, that's how you can deal with the spectral degeneracy. And then the heteroclinic degeneracy, where things broaden into a front, that's super easy. Um, you can't have things that broaden into sort of two copies of a front, because fronts don't exist at the end. OK, so that was a sort of very fast uh, and, again, sketchy uh, description of one way of thinking about how you might construct large amplitude solitary water waves. And so now I want to say a little bit about some open questions, just for this classical problem uh, with solitary water waves. Um, as for, I mean, these, these are at least questions that I would be very interested to know the answers to, and as far as I know, uh, remain open. Um, so I've said a lot about existence and nice properties about waves, but I haven't said very much about uniqueness. So one question you might ask is, these curves of solutions originally constructed by Amick and Tolan, these continua of solutions constructed by Amick and Tolan in 1981, are these all the waves there are? I mean, they have some singular limit with a, 120, with a corner at its crest, but is this curve it or are there other ways? Is there some other connected component of solutions uh, hiding out there? We know from the qualitative theory that those, whatever solutions out there are, they're still symmetric and monotone and supercritical, but are they connected somehow? to this KDV branch or are they disconnected? Um, probably a very hard problem. Another very hard problem is, um, is there some set of parameters that you can tell me that you, let you 
that uniquely specify which solitary wave you're talking about. So you might think, you might naively think, uh, and certainly if you sort of do just the beginnings of your numerical uh, calculations, you might think that solitary waves sort of up to scaling are uniquely determined by their fruit number. But this is not true. This is sort of very much not true. Um, and there's this very nice paper by Plotnikov in 1981, I mean, 1991, uh, that makes this very clear. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not some other set of parameters about a solitary wave, which might set it apart. So, so, so I'd say sort of, unless we're talking about very small waves, we know very little about the uniqueness of these things. And so you might hope, or at least I would hope to, to know more. Um, another question related to these Amick and Tolan papers is, uh, you can construct lots of solitary waves as long wavelength limits of periodic waves, but can you do the reverse? So if I hand you a solitary wave, can you uh, approximate it by a sequence of periodic waves or not? And then finally, probably the most important uh, question from a physical point of view is the nonlinear stability of at least small amplitude solitary waves. So linearly, this is done in this Pago Soon paper, and something about sort of how the stability must change as you go along the bifurcation curve is in this uh, paper by Zhu Lin in 2009, but nonlinear stability, as far as I know, is completely open. Okay, and then so I think in the final slide or two, I just want to say that uh, there are, of course, many, many effects that I've neglected here. Maybe I won't read all of these things, but sort of as you add extra effects, uh, some of these things have been generalized. I think a lot of this has been generalized with vorticity, but of course not all of it. Um, but especially if you add stratification or surface tension or multiple layers, then a lot of these questions become much harder and sort of complete, and a lot of things are just sort of completely open. Um, and then maybe I'll end with just a, what I think is gonna be a, just a preview of what Sam's gonna talk about next week. But uh, in this uh, recent preprint with uh, Ming and Sam, we sort of have a theory, not for solitary ways, but for front type solutions, where again, we're doing global bifurcation, but now for fronts and in this two layer system. And I won't sort of say exactly what our result is, but sort of it's consistent with the numerics and the, the, but, the but really these two pictures are based on the numerics, which suggests that sort of in one direction, as you sort of make this layer on the left uh, thinner, uh, the surface overturns. So, and in the other direction, as you sort of make this layer on the left thicker, it actually attaches to the top wall and you get a little 60 degree opening angle here. And then this whole bit of fluid here is totally at rest in the moving frame. So a very strange thing. I think it's called a gravity current. So anyway, that's a little preview maybe for the sorts of things that Sam's gonna talk about next week and it's sort of a preview for the, exciting, the excitement that is uh, multiple layer waves and waves with stratification. And I'll stop there. Okay, um, thank you very much, Miles. Um, uh, we'll go through the usual drill here of me muting everyone in order to give you the right to unmute yourselves. Just a second. Okay, you should be able to unmute yourselves. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? That was a beautiful talk. Thank, thank you, Miles. Uh, I do have a question. Mm -hmm. So in in this center manifold, like bifurcation, you are somehow needing the fact that your domain is is unbounded, right? Is what? Um, that the that the domain is unbounded is the whole real line. Yes, yes, that's crucial. As opposed to like periodic, when uh, when you can do like the no, no. So so you can use the, well. I mean, you can. So these spatial dynamics techniques also construct periodic waves just as easily. Okay, now my question, okay, it was sort of related to that. Like, can you do it in a bounded domain? Say non-periodic, but with like, I don't know, Dirichlet boundary conditions or things like that. Mm, not as, e I think, I think there may be some results in this direction. I think, uh, I think there may be a paper by Milka on this um, <laughs> about elasticity. I can, I can look up the reference. Um, but it's a uh, it's a much more tenuous statement. I think that if you if you if you really want this sort of like everything's really reduced to an ODE with no sort of uh, epsilons and deltas involved, um, as far as I know, you really need uh, this sort of time like direction to be uh, the real line. Like naively, one can expect that some kind of transformation in space, and you map the bounded domain into the unbounded domain, and then you're in like the situation that you're described. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I but think I that there wonder are... if this is sort of like 
streamlined somewhere or, or like if anybody has thought about this? Oh, so, so say you take some, so you're imagining a problem just sort of in a bounded domain with like Dirichlet boundary conditions, and then you want to sort of hit this with this technique. So I think you can do these sorts of things. There are, um, there are things where you take, uh, some people talk about you have a bounded domain and you sort of dilate it down to a point and you sort of think of this sort of like scaling parameter as your time-like variable and you take a log somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. And so you can do these sorts of things. Um, my sort of uh, inexpert uh, impression of these is that uh, the results are somehow weaker and harder to use. Um, okay. by a long yeah, I was thinking taking something like the, the tangent of X or something like that and then you, you sort of like make the make the domain unbounded and then yeah 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 well i mean maybe to say a little so, so so somehow at least what makes this calculation work and what make what, when you're, you're applying this theory the fact that your problem is sort of translation invariant is hugely useful uh -huh. and so if you break translation invariance uh then again i mean it doesn't completely ruin things but it it, it ruins things a little bit okay okay thanks uh miles mm -hmm. so you are able to relate it to a, a 1D, an ODE. Um, is it, so essentially what would, can you adapt this to the case of three-dimensional waves or when the surface is two-dimensional? Is there? <clears throat> yes, I am not gonna be able to remember exactly the references on this, but so for instance, you could take, um, say you have a, say you have a solitary wave, say you have a, a solitary wave with a one-dimensional surface, and now you think of this as a boring solution with a two-dimensional surface. And now you think of that uh, transverse direction, now you think of that as your time-like direction. And so now your sort of phase space is sort of whole slices. Um, and you could look for, and you could do sort of like a Lyapunov center argument there and sort of get sort of periodically uh, extended solitary waves. And there's a whole zoo of things like this. Sort of tr it's related to when people do sort of transverse, when people do proofs of like transverse stability, instability of some of these one dimensional solutions, I think very often sort of lurking in the background, there were sort of exciting families of uh, steady waves at the same time. Sometimes these are done together in, in the same paper. So you, you, you certainly can uh, do that. I think that what, what's the, the challenging thing that I haven't seen done is something where you have like a fully localized solution where you're using like a radial variable as time. In principle, you could take a log and do that. And I know there are some papers, some people in geometry are able to make this work. But as far as I know, for water waves, uh, this has never been done successfully. But so just, uh, but for example, you would find the equivalent of the uh, homoclinic orbit and be able to construct a solution which is so it would be uh, localized in one direction, and then even in the other direction, you would also be able to make it localized. Yeah, that I don't think has been done. Yeah, that seems to be difficult, but sort of localized in one direction and periodic in the other, or periodic in both directions. I think these have been done. I think uh, all of the constructions of fully localized uh, water waves that I know of are uh, somehow variational or use the implicit function theorem or something like that. They don't use these uh, dynamical systems tools. Thanks. Anything else? Well, I had one other thing, but uh, it's just because you promised us a fun story about the conjugate wave. Oh, sure. So, so let me see if I can, perhaps I, perhaps I shouldn't have promised, but yeah, so, so, so somehow the way it would be better if I had sort of, I'm not going to get my little document camera set up, but that, that's how the, to give an honest answer to this question, I would need to write. Um, but basically what you can think about here is that you have, um, let's say we fix the flux. So let's say we fix the product of C and D. So now somehow the set of sort of possible limits that we're looking at is one dimensional. It has a single parameter. And so we have this one parameter family of uh, solutions, trivial solutions somehow, but solutions. Uh, to this problem, say parameterized by this depth, capital D. And so you can think of uh, these quantities on the right, so, that, so now we somehow dealt with the first equation. The first equation's done. I mean, that's how you would do it when you're doing the algebra anyway. So now let's think of these two equations. So if you think about the right and left-hand sides, they're somehow both functions of this capital D, 
right? So, so this left-hand side is what you get when you plug uh, capital D equals little d, and that forces the speed to also be the little c because of this first condition here on the mass. And similarly here, so, so you think of the energy and the momentum both as functions of this capital D. And so now you're looking for somehow, you know, sort of a simultaneous route of these in, involving, you know, so you're sort of looking at, you're interested in these two functions and sort of when they're equal. And it turns out that essentially that this first function that you get, this energy, is convex in D. So that's thing one. And then it also turns out that the, let me see if I get this right, the derivative of this function with respect to D, the, the sort of momentum function that you get, is the energy function. And so, some, so, so you somehow, so you make some little argument with a parabola so for something that's convex and you assume you draw some sort of line across it and the, you know, area that you get there is non-zero and that's somehow the argument. So somehow it's the convexity of the energy in the depth and the fact that the derivative of the momentum with respect to depth in this sort of strange setup is the energy. And if you want to think about things with vorticity, you have to do it this way because things are a bit more implicit um, because you have some shear flow that's undetermined. And so you really need to uh, understand this relationship. And this relationship is true about the derivative of the momentum being energy. I don't have a reason, I don't know physically why this is true, um, but it is true and it's true even with density stratification. But what fails, what, what fails when you have density stratification is the convexity of the energy in D. And this is where you can have pores if you have two fluids. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so if you, yeah, I mean, so for instance, if you just have two fluids, then you write a whole big messy system. And then somehow, I mean, you have this one fact that when you take the derivative of momentum, you get energy. But other than that, as, as far as I can tell, there's sort of no nice structural property to take advantage of. And indeed, you find lots of roots in sort of mysterious places. So, so for the, so for the project with Sam and Ming uh, here, somehow we're able to make progress because we can just explicitly solve these polynomial. I mean, we weren't the first to do it. Um, I forget what the right refer the oldest reference is to give for this, but somehow we just sort of by brute force uh, can explicitly solve those polynomial equations. Uh, there's sort of no intuition being used. I mean, at some point you have to like, I mean, if you sort of want to guess it, you have to take like the resultant of some, I mean, it, it's, it's messy, but, but can be done explicitly, it turns out. Cool. Thanks. Anything else? Okay, well, let's thank Miles again. Uh, and as a, an advertisement for next time, um, we, will, uh, we will see Sam Walsh uh, from the University of Missouri. Um, and I guess, yeah, we'll get to find out if he is mad at Miles. Uh, <laughs> um, Okay, uh, thank you all for coming.